Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Friday Morning Storytime in Room 309. Today I'm going to read to you the story of Sinbad the Sailor. If a story is well written, it's automatically a lesson. And I don't feel like any particular piece of literature is for children or for adults. It's just a story. And if a story is a good story, it connects with the human heart in some way. The great wheel of the moon was on the horizon, and the night was red. Surrounded by the scent of roses, I listened to the silent pulse of Baghdad, city of perfumes and soft fabrics. Suddenly, a stranger took me by the hand, saying, Come to the house of Sinbad, for tonight he will tell the story of his voyages. I followed him through cool streets made fresh by the night, and he led me to an ancient palace where an odor of nutmeg clung and a fragrant aloes. The gatekeeper motioned for me to enter. Moving through the shadows led down great marble halls in which the air was as blue as tunnels of snow. We turned sharply, took several steps up, and entered a vast audience chamber in whose center, like so many sumptuous Corollas, the turbans of my host and his entourage appeared even more magnificent than the nearby banks of flowers. At their hub, bearded and festooned with necklaces, rings, and pearls, Sinbad sparkled. The entire rear of the hall was open to the night and to the full moon. Sinbad greeted us, gesturing for us to take our places among his guests. Servants brought in trays loaded with delicate foods. Birds gelled with honey. Little loaves made of almond flour. Jasmine sherbets. Eglantine jellies, jams of wild thyme, and a thousand cakes whose name I didn't know. All these things were placed before us. And I realized then that the only true art is the marriage of opposites. Sauces infinitely and subtly blended, the bitter to the sweet. Disorder and arrangement. The beautiful and the deformed. Finally, Sinbad laid aside the long, coiled stem of his garment, and his attendant raised a hand for attention. You could have heard a pin drop. Then Sinbad spoke. One need never totally despair, he said, for at the moment when all seems lost, the wave of bad luck has reached too high a crest not to break. I have never been so close to riches as at the peak of misfortune because it was precisely then, at the darkest moment, that I pulled myself together and my strength resurged, bringing with it good fortune. I have seen oceans where the sun rises and have trod atolls that are like giant's rings fallen from the sky. I have plied trade from sandbanks to deltas and from islands to archipelagos. I've traded fabrics for ginger and camphor cinnamon and spiked cloves for ambergris, ivory, and pearls. The first time I put to sea, we sailed so far south that the sun drew great geysers of steam from the water so that as we pitched through the mist, squalls of stagnant rain lashed the sides of the ship. Farther south, the heat lessened, and we hove in sight for a small island that seemed to us remarkably pleasant. After many days of monotonous sea, that we decided to land and take a meal. But no sooner had we lit our fire that the island buckled under an appalling earthquake and plunged into an abyss. In the maelstrom that resulted, all of my shipmates drowned. A beam to which I clung saved my life. I drifted with the wind, wondering what kind of fish, so huge we had mistaken its back for an island, swam those waters. For a long time I drifted to where the waves swept me, doubting I'd be saved, but determined to survive. The next day, the sea suddenly began to boil, and enormous fish surged from the deep, some striped in blue, red, and green, others with the heads of dragons, and fins so vast that for long moments they were able to fly. I thought my last hour had come, but these strange fish had such kind faces that I took courage. One of the dragons approached, 
swam under me so that I was forced to sprawl on its back and then raced into the east, escorted by his fellows. Finally, he landed me on a stony beach, and the entire school, perhaps in farewell, performed a series of gliding leaps and flights before swimming off to the high seas. Hastening to the interior of the island, in the hopes of finding a village in which to rest, I found nothing but bursting fruits. I ate some and felt better. After having slept, I set out once more and saw that apart from its lush coast, the island was an empty desert, in the center of which curious white spheres rose here and there, intriguingly perfect. I approached one, circled it, and saw that it was as hermetic as an egg. Then I remembered the legend of the white egg of the desert, whose shadow is as sharp as loneliness. Suddenly, the sky darkened. I raised my head and saw a gigantic bird falling on me. Realizing I was in its nest, I pressed close to the egg and waited. When the bird settled down, I was imprisoned by its huge bulk, but I felt no discomfort, for its stomach, supported by feet as big as cedars, arched well above me. It occurred to me that I could lash myself to the foot of the bird and so make my escape on its next flight to some neighboring island. I unrolled my turban, and having lashed myself in place, I was indeed carried off by the bird to its hunting ground on another island. When it landed to seize an enormous serpent, I quickly untied myself and lay there, my head reeling from the great height of the trip. A hissing sound brought me to my senses. I was in a steep and narrow valley, along the entire length of which gigantic serpents coiled and uncoiled, their angry, bladed eyes focused at me. I didn't know where to run, but other great birds appeared overhead, and so the serpents quickly hid. Momentarily safe, I examined my new prison and discovered diamonds, rubies, and emeralds strewn on the ground. Gathering up the most beautiful of these stones, I filled a sack which I wore round my neck. Now and then a serpent reared high to threaten me, but noting that those frightful reptiles never left the shade, I carefully remained in full sunlight during my descent to the sea. On reaching the shore and having the good luck to sight a passing ship, I climbed a high rock. Once more my turban saved me. By waving it banner-like, I attracted the ship's lookout, and a small boat was sent to rescue me. The diamonds more than made my fortune. After so many disasters, my first voyage had ended in success. I don't know why I returned to sea later, and so often. Perhaps I sought some unattainable dream. Perhaps I persuaded myself that the ideal was after all within my reach, simply by crossing the sea. In any case, I said to myself, fill up your time to escape nostalgia and regret. Travel the earth, for perhaps it is your heaven. One day, we shipwrecked on an island so black that its darkness shone out on the sea. A vessel broke up on the rocks, and amidst an avalanche of beams, planks, chests, and diverse bales, we were swept ashore. No sooner had we recovered from this experience that we saw an army of small, hairy men bearing down on us. Having bound our hands, these dwarves dragged us off to the island's center. There, a huge, dark castle loomed. We were forced to enter it, and were penned up in a courtyard of smooth, black walls. At sunset, when the air glowed as red as embers, a great ebony door suddenly crashed open. Entering the courtyard was a terrible giant, as tall as a palm tree, and with a single huge eye on his forehead. His mouth gaped like a horse's. His long teeth were pointed. Advancing, he examined us one by one, prodded us, weighed us in his hand, and then finally chose the fattest, which happened to be our captain. Grabbing him by the nape of the neck, the giant lit a roaring fire, and having run a spit through the captain's body, began to roast him. Afterward, we were forced to witness the monster's grotesque meal, and then to spend all night listening to his snores, for he fell asleep 
as soon as he had spit out the last of the captain's bones. The same scene was repeated the next day, and the next. We knew we would all die if we didn't act. Having held a council of war, we decided that the next time the ogre slept, we would drive the skewers that lay near him into his single eye. This was done, and while the ogre screamed in pain, we ran to the beach, stole a large boat, and rowed out to sea. So earth-shaking were the shrieks and bellows of the wounded monster that the great castle split open and collapsed. An immense cloud of black soot rose from it, darkening the sky. After that, silence descended. However, our nightmare was anything but over, for the place we landed was inhabited by tribes devoted to strange cults. Never without their long lances, the men were only a belt, from which were draped strips of cloth. Both men and women wore fur caps adorned with little silver horns. Those people greeted us with a show of friendship that almost deceived me, as it did my shipmates. The liquor they offered us, fortunately I only pretended to drink, went straight to my friends' heads. They became so docile that they were easily fattened and slaughtered, none offering the least resistance. I, on the other hand, let myself waste away to such an extent that I was allowed to stray like a sick dog. Meantime, I gathered and hid away provisions. Ready at last, I took to the forest, where I trekked long weeks before finally meeting some coconut merchants. They told me we were in Comori, and they intended to load two big ships with coconuts bound for Basura. They suggested that I share in their work and their profits. The work was simple enough. When we spotted some handsome fruit, we stoned monkeys in the trees, and they immediately responded by throwing coconuts at us. We then had merely to gather up the nuts. When the cargo was full, we sailed to Basura, and from there I made my way to Baghdad, returning to my palace and filling it with new treasures. Motionless and alone, I often stood on the terrace, and so clear were the nights it seemed to me that I was at the heart of a giant crystal. Then the times of doubt returned. I no longer knew if I were awake or dreaming. So once again I had to go to those distant lands where the sun is too high to cast a shadow. Perhaps the worst experience I had during my travels was when I was cast ashore, sole survivor of a shipwreck, on an island that at first seemed a paradise. I found huge purple flowers, so lovely that their beauty blinded my eyes. Fruits and birds abounded. I lived off the land and at night I lay on a thick bed of moss. Almost forgetting my plight, I remained there until one day I met a creature so gaunt and ancient that I couldn't tell if it were a man or a woman beneath its gray sackcloth. In a weak voice, this ancient asked me to carry it across a stream on my shoulders, which I did. But once on the far bank, the ancient refused to get down, wrapping its arms and legs about me so tightly that I had to continue carrying it for fear of suffocation. This lasted for days. I had hoped to escape at night, but even when we lay down to sleep, the ancient held its grip. I couldn't move a muscle without immediately feeling its embrace tighten, constricting. I forgot how its face looked, for I had barely seen it. Its embrace became a terrible presence, something like the very weight of destiny itself. Last, I reached a point at which it seemed to me that I was at my death. Oddly, as soon as I understood that, the awful weight lessened, as if the ancient were diminishing and weakening. My taste for flowers and for fine landscapes returned. One morning, I awoke, free. A little later, some fishermen rescued me from that mysterious island. They told me of the old man of the sea, who strangles young men. As for me, I knew that so long as I controlled my fear, the old man would remain invisible. While sailing towards Salahed, we sighted another island to our starboard. Its vegetation was so fragrant that it perfumed the air. I asked the captain its name. The Island of the Serpent, he said. It has the world's most beautiful flowers. And at its center there's a giant tree on which they say the fruits of wisdom grow. But the serpent prevents all approach. I begged 
that we land to see these wonders. And at last the captain consented. Armed with a great bow, I and another passenger landed on the beach. The breeze, blowing through the stems of countless flowers, made lovely musical sounds. We approached the tree. Its trunk and its branches were gigantic, and since the serpent was nowhere in sight, we decided to gather some of the golden fruits peeping through the leaves. I climbed up first, going quickly from branch to branch, followed by my less agile companion. Suddenly I heard a terrible hissing, and turning saw the serpent's large flat head rising toward us. Its enormous body must have measured more than fifty fathoms. In the wink of an eye, my companion was lashed by the monster's forked tongue and snapped up into its horrible jaw. The serpent returned to the ground to swallow its prey. I knew he wouldn't leave the foot of the tree where he could prevent my escape, but I hoped to frustrate his attacks by hiding among the high branches. Later, while he slept, I thought I might be able to slip past him on the shore. But his occasional hissing warned me that he was on his guard, so I knew I had to hang on. For such is the final wisdom of life itself. I would survive as long as possible among the high branches. Suddenly it seemed to me that the earth was heaving, or rather, that a mountain was advancing on me. The mountain turned out to be an elephant so massive that his ears alone would have sheltered a town. As he approached, I saw all the pity in the world and all the tenderness of his immense round eyes. Raising his trunk, he gently grasped me and in a few steps placed me on the ship's bridge where his appearance caused a panic. I reassured everyone, recounted my adventure, and then had them set sail as the elephant disappeared on the horizon, perhaps lying down in the sea to become another island. After that, I returned to Baghdad, without hindrance, but only lingered there briefly, for I soon set sail for South Africa with a squadron of ships that had just exchanged cargoes in our sublime port. A tempest separated my ship from the rest of the fleet, and we were swept southeast by a current running so swiftly that it made a deep trough in the sea, carrying us down between the two towering walls of water. One day, a barrier reared before us, a rock on which we foundered, exploding in a great geyser. Only a few of us regained consciousness among the debris left there by thousands of shipwrecks. We were in an absolutely smooth circle of black stone which was impossible to scale, nor could we launch a raft on the still raging sea. At the circle's bottom, we found a grotto in which a river, instead of flowing to the sea, plunged under the earth. I was the only one who dared risk escape that way, and so set out alone on a small raft loaded with provisions and treasures gathered from the wrecked ships. How long did I sweep through the dark? Impossible to measure time and distance. Since the darkness was pitch, I closed my eyes and motionless listened to my heartbeat and my deep breathing. And thus began another voyage inside my heart. A voyage within a voyage. One day, in a place where the river forked into many canals, I suddenly emerged from darkness. A crowd of men dressed in bright colors tilled the fields bordering the riverbank. Several of them helped me ashore and escorted me to their ruler's palace. Sitting cross-legged on the platform, like an Indian, the prince received me civilly. He listened to the story of my adventures, then had gold plate, jewels, and precious stones brought before me, and through one of his ministers, told me that all these things were mine, for I was the first person to have descended the underground river and attempted a trip through its interior. Afterward, his men escorted me to the port, and one of his ships sailed me back to the Arabian coast. From there, I returned to Baghdad with new riches. Five years have now elapsed, and... Retired here, I see the world around me reflecting my memory, a mirror of my past voyages. But the moon is red, and soon the desert wind will blow. I've ordered my camels saddled, and if you will join me, we will set out together for the salt mountains that are the center of the earth. For I dream now of sailing the sands that, as many caravans sway past in silence, I may hear it said, Here comes Sindbad, the landman. The end.